Welcome to the second part of the discussion of the Vidiosity rendering concept. In the first part I have discussed the rendering equation and how to get from the rendering equation to the Vidiosity equation, which is the basis for the Vidiosity concept. I have also discussed the area form of the governing equation that is particularly relevant for the Vidiosity concept. Then I have outlined the general idea of the Vidiosity concept. We have seen that the Vidiosity approach computes an approximate representation for the full light transport in a scene. We have also seen that this is only possible in the case of severe restrictions. First, all surfaces have to be Lambertian, and second, the Vidiosity is constant for all positions within one phase. Now, here in the second part of the presentation, we continue with the derivation of the Vidiosity rendering approach. In the first part, we have derived the continuous form of the Vidiosity equation that we consider at all points P of a scene. If we consider this equation at all surface points, we would end up with an infinite number of unknown Vidiosity values. In order to reduce the number of unknown Vidiosity values to a finite number n, we now discretize the scene geometry into n phases, for instance triangles. Then we assume that the Vidiosity is constant for all positions within one phase in order to get just one unknown Vidiosity value per phase. If we now consider one Vidiosity equation per phase, then we get n Vidiosity equations for n unknown Vidiosity values. The resulting linear system is shown here and in the following I'm going to discuss how to get from the continuous form of the Vidiosity equation to this system. The continuous form of the Vidiosity equation depends on a position that represents a differential area and now we are interested in a form of the Vidiosity equation that depends on a phase or triangle with an area of finite size. So for each triangle in a scene we would like to work with one unknown Vidiosity value and with one Vidiosity equation. Therefore we consider a scene representation that consists of phases, for instance triangles. The form of the phases actually does not matter at all, but triangles are a popular scene representation. Now we assume that the Vidiosity at all positions xi within a phase i with area ai is constant. So b of xi is equal to the Vidiosity bi of phase i for all positions xi of phase i. We further assume that the reflectance rho is constant within one phase. So we do not have reflectance values per position xi, but instead we have one reflectance value per phase i. Now we take the Vidiosity equation and integrate all terms over the area ai of phase i. On the left hand side of the equation we integrate the Vidiosity values over the area ai and on the right hand side we integrate the emitted and the reflected Vidiosities over the area ai. S indicates an integral over all phases and SI indicates an integral over one phase I. Now we use the fact that the Vidiosity and the reflectance are constant within one phase. So the integral on the left hand side is simply the product of the Vidiosity BI of phase I times the area AI of phase I. The same holds for the emission term on the right hand side where BEI is the emitted Vidiosity at phase I. The integral that represents the reflected Vidiosity is also integrated over the area of phase I and as the reflectance rho is constant within phase I, it can be put in front of the integral. The resulting equation now contains some quantities that just depend on the phase I. However, in the integral on the right hand side, we still have terms that depend on particular positions. For instance, the kernel k depends on xi, which is a position within phase i, and on position x, which is an arbitrary position of the scene geometry. And also the Vidiosity in the integral depends on the position x. Now the two integrals on the right hand side are further processed with the goal to remove the position dependencies. Therefore the integral over all phases is written as a sum of integrals over the individual phases. So in each integral we integrate over all positions xj of a phase j and then we sum up all integrals. 
This relation is now used to rewrite the form of the radiosity equation from the previous slide. We start with the respective form and we now replace the integral over the entire surface with the sum of the integrals over individual phases j. We also divide the equation by the area of phase i. Finally, we change the order of the sum and the integral. We now have two integrals over the phases i and j and we sum up the integrals over all phases. The transformations of the integrals on the previous slide are motivated by the fact that the radiosity b is constant within a phase. To see this, we start with the final form of the radiosity equation from the previous slide. Now the radiosity b in the integral depends on a position xj, which is a position within phase j. And we remember that we assume that all radiosity values within one phase are constant. So b of xj is constant and can be put in front of the integral. In the resulting form of the radiosity equation, all radiosity values just depend on a phase. So for each phase i, we can consider one equation of this form and we would get n equations with n unknown radiosity values bi. The equation is not yet entirely discretized. We still have integrals of the kernel function over two phases i and j that have to be approximated. The approximation of these integrals is actually the most expensive task in a radiosity renderer, but for now we just assume that we can compute the respective values in some way. Here we introduce a variable f that depends on two phases i and j. f is referred to as form factor and is equal to the two integrals divided by the area of phase i. Using the form factor notation, the radiosity equation can be written like this. If we assume that we can estimate the form factor f for all pairs of phases i and j, then we have a discretized form of the radiosity equation. Now each phase i has a radiosity value bi. And when we consider one discretized radiosity equation per phase, then we get n equations for n unknown radiosity values. The approximations of the integrals for the form factors can be arbitrarily complex depending on the accuracy that we would like to achieve and also depending on the complexity of the scene geometry. Now here on this slide I'd like to discuss a simplistic approximation that might be useful for a first implementation. We see the definition of the form factor and now we simply assume that the kernel function in the integrand is constant. In this case the kernel value kij for the pair of phases i and j can be put in front of the integral. The two integrals can now be computed which gives the product of the areas of the phases i and j. Finally, we get k of i and j times the area of phase j for the form factor f i j. In order to compute a constant kernel value for a pair of phases i and j, we could choose two representative positions p i and p j on the respective phases, as also shown in the illustration. For these two positions, we can estimate the visibility function and we can compute the cosine terms and the distance between both points. Now we have an approximation of the form factor for the phases i and j. It's obvious that this approximation is typically bad, but at least we now have an idea how the most expensive task in a radiosity renderer looks like. Here we have a summary of the discretization process. We started with the continuous form of the radiosity equation that considers radiosity values per position. Then we have derived a discretized version of the equation that only considers radiosity values per phase. In this equation, BEI represents known emitted radiosity at phase i, BI and BJ are unknown radiosities at phases i and j, and rho i and f i j are known coefficients. So for each phase we have an equation that relates unknown radiosity values. If we now consider the discretized radiosity equation at all phases, then we get n equations for n unknown radiosities at n phases as indicated in the illustration. 
Here black and gray line segments indicate faces of a scene and red and orange line segments indicate faces that emit light. Now we set up a system of equations where we consider the radiosity equation at all faces. If a phase belongs to a light source, the emission term BEI in the equation is larger than zero. If a phase does not emit light, then BEI is equal to zero. The coefficient rho i in each equation is the reflectance of phase i. For a phase of a scene geometry, this is the color. For a phase of a light source, this value could, for instance, be set to, to zero. If rho i is equal to zero, it is easy to see that the radiosity bi at a phase of a light source is just equal to the emitted radiosity bei. If rho i is not equal to zero for a light source, then the light source does not only emit light, but it also reflects incident light. It is also easy to see that the radiosities for all phases would be zero if none of the phases emits light. If the emitted radiosity BEI is zero for all phases, then BI equal to zero for all phases is the obvious solution. Another special case are perfectly black phases that do not emit light. For a black phase, the reflectance value is equal to zero, and if such a phase does not emit light, then the radiosity of this phase is also equal to zero. The setting from the previous slide with n equations for n unknown radiosities results in the linear system that is shown here. We have a system matrix with known coefficients where the rho i are the known reflectance values of the phases and the f i j are the known form factors for pairs of phases i and j. The vector with the radiosity values b i is unknown and the source vector on the right hand side represents the known emitted radiosity values for all phases. We can also say that the source vector on the right hand side represents the direct illumination, while the matrix coefficients on the left hand side characterize the indirect illumination. Large coefficients indicate large illumination effects among phases, while small coefficients indicate less light transport between two phases. By solving this linear system, we get the radiosity values at all phases which are an approximate representation of the full light transport in the scene. Now we know how the linear system looks like that we have to solve in order to compute the radiosity values at all phases of a scene. As a next step, we have to solve this system, and in the following I will briefly outline one option. One simple option to solve the linear system is the relaxed Jacobi scheme. The scheme is iterative and its implementation is straightforward as indicated here. We first initialize the radiosities B for all phases I with some value, for instance with zero. Then we iteratively update the solution vector from iteration L to L plus one for all phases I. In this update, lambda is a user-defined parameter that governs the solver convergence. For smaller values, we need more iterations to converge to the correct solution, while the convergence might not be guaranteed for larger values. The intuition of the update step is rather straightforward. The update from BL to BL plus 1 for a phase i is proportional to the difference of component i of the source term vector and the scalar product of rho i of the system matrix with the solution vector. If this difference is zero, we have a solution and a solver update would not change the solution vector. So if BL plus one is approximately equal to BL for all phases I, the solver updates can be terminated. Solving the linear system is one of the last steps in the radiosity rendering concept. Once we have the radiosity values at all phases, we can render images. Now here on this slide, we have a summary of our steps. First, the scene has to be modeled. The geometry and the reflection properties of all phases have to be defined, and also light sources have to be modeled. In order to set up the system, the form factors have to be estimated, and then the system can be solved. Now we can render images. We set up a camera and project the scene onto the view plane, or we cast rays into the scene. If we have determined the phase of the scene that is visible at a sensor element, 
Then we look up the respective radiosity value of that phase and reconstruct the radiance, which means that we just divide the radiosity by p. Here we see two examples of the geometry of a scene. On the left hand side we have a smaller number of phases with varying sizes and on the right hand side we have a larger number of smaller phases. It's rather obvious that smaller phases improve the accuracy of the computed light transport, but smaller phases also result in larger systems with more unknowns and more form factors. As illustrated in the example, adaptive sizes of the phases can easily be handled and also different shapes. When we have computed the light transport for a model scene, we can render images like this. Please note again that the approach only handles Lambertian surfaces. On the other hand, it's rather efficient to render different views of the same scene when the light transport has been computed. That's it about the introduction to the radiosity concept. Now in the following I'd like to discuss a few aspects in some more detail. The first aspect that I'd like to discuss are the form factors because they are important and expensive to compute. The worst case in terms of the complexity is indicated in this example. Here we have a scene where all faces see each other. So the reflections of all faces contribute to the illumination of all other faces. In this case the system matrix is fully filled with non-zero coefficients, which means that the number of form factors that have to be determined is quadratic in the number of faces. Due to the importance and due to the complexity of the form factor computation, a lot of research has been conducted in that area. As can be seen in the overview, there exist some analytic techniques for simple and special settings and there exists a large variety of techniques that numerically solve the integral and the form factor. I do not go into details here, but the numerical methods typically sample the areas of the involved phases and then they process rays between pairs of samples. A comprehensible introduction to concepts that are used to estimate form factors can be found in the book from Cohn and Wallace that is stated here on the slide. The illustration is also taken from that book. Form factors have certain properties that can be useful in the computations of these coefficients. First of all, they are larger or equal to zero. This follows from the fact that all values in the integrand are larger or equal to zero and also the area AI is positive. The cosine terms would be negative for angles that are larger than 90 degree, but in this case the values are clamped to zero. Angles larger than 90 degree between the direction omega i and any of the surface normals n correspond to the fact that two phases point away from each other. In this case there is no light interaction between the phases and the cosine terms are clamped to zero. The next property is the so-called reciprocity relation. It is straightforward to see that the kernel function for two points xi and xj is equal to the kernel function for the points xj and xi. Now the form factor fij times the area ai is defined as the integral over the two phases i and j. ai divided by ai can be replaced by aj divided by aj. The order of the integrals can be changed and also the order of the variables xi and xj in the kernel function can be changed. Now we see that the resulting term is equal to the form factor fji times the area aj. So if we know the form factor for a pair i, j, this relation can be used to efficiently derive the form factor for the pair j, i. Another interesting property is the fact that the form factors f, i, j for each phase i sum up to 1. In order to see this, we use the definition of the form factor and we change the order of the sum and the integral over phase i. Now we have a sum of integrals over all phases j, where we consider points xj that are visible from point xi. When we transform the integral over phase j from the area form to the hemispherical form, 
then we see that the sum of the integrals is equal to an integral over the hemisphere, here indicated by 2 pi. The visibility function, one of the cosine terms, and the squared distance are removed from the integrand due to the conversion from area to hemispherical form. Now the integral of the cosine term over the hemisphere gives p, integrating 1 over the area ai gives ai, and the final result is 1. This property might also be useful for the efficient computation of form factors. If we have, for instance, a phase where we have computed just a few form factors to other phases, and these form factors already sum up to 1, then we can conclude that all other form factors for that phase have to be zero. Another interesting aspect of this property is the analysis of the solver convergence. If the sum of form factors is 1, then the multiplication of this sum with the reflectance gives a value smaller or equal to 1. And from this relation, we can see that the sum of the absolute values of the off-diagonal elements is smaller or equal to the diagonal elements in the radiosity system matrix. This means that we have a diagonally dominant system, which is an important property for the convergence of linear solvers. That's it about the form factors. Now in the following I'd like to discuss the linear system of the radiosity approach and also its solution. First we introduce variables for the involved matrices and vectors. As shown here, the system matrix can be written as the difference of the identity matrix I and a matrix F that contains all form factors multiplied with some reflectance coefficients. If B is a vector of all radiosity values and BE is the source vector, then we can write the radiosity system as I minus F times B is equal to BE. Alternatively, we can also write that B is equal to BE plus F times B. In the discussion of the continuous form of the radiosity equation, we have seen that the radiosity at a point P is the sum of emitted radiosity and reflected radiosity due to the illumination from other phases. Now the discretized matrix equation can be interpreted in the same way. B is a vector of radiosities at all phases, and these radiosities are sums of emitted radiosities stored in vector BE and reflected radiosities stored in the vector F times B. The matrix vector product F times B represents the radiosities at all phases due to the reflection of incident flux from all phases. Solving the system corresponds to the computation of the inverse of the system matrix as shown here. If you have the inverse of I minus F, we can multiply this inverse with the source vector to get the solution vector. Now it turns out that the inverse of I minus F is equal to the so-called Neumann series if the inverse exists. So the inverse of the system matrix is the identity matrix plus F plus F times F and so on if this series converges. This also means that the solution vector B can be written as the sum of the source vector BE plus F times source vector plus F times F times source vector and so on. Now, why is it relevant that we can write our solution as a product of a Neumann series with the source vector? One of the most important motivations to use the Neumann series is the fact that the individual terms in the series can be interpreted in a rather intuitive way. This interpretation is relevant for the radiosity concept, but in addition to this, it is also relevant to improve the intuition for other global illumination concepts. In particular, the Neumann series helps to understand why recursive ray tracing converges to a correct solution of the full light transport in a scene. So what is the interpretation of the terms in the sum? The first term, BE, is the source vector that contains the radiosity values of all light sources. The second term, F times BE, represents the reflected radiosity values due to the emitted radiosity BE. This is basically the emitted radiosity after one bounce at a surface. The next term, F times F times BE, is the reflected radiosity due to reflected radiosity 
due to the emitted radiosity BE. So here we have a radiosity contribution due to the emitted radiosity after two surface bounces, and so on. So in summary, the radiosity at the surfaces is the sum of emitted radiosity and of emitted radiosity after one, two, three, and so on bounces at surfaces. And all these terms contribute to the solution. Emitted light and light from other sources, but also light from sources that hits a surface after one, two or more bounces. It's interesting to note that the terms get smaller and smaller if a solution exists. On one hand, this is required for the convergence of the series. On the other hand, this can also be seen from the interpretation of the terms. If light bounces at surfaces, it gets partially absorbed. And the more bounces we have, the more light gets absorbed. This means that the radiosity contributions get smaller for a growing number of bounces. An interesting counterexample is a scene where all Lambertian phases perfectly reflect all incoming light. I do not want to discuss this setting here, but it's certainly interesting to think about this case. Here we have an illustration of the terms in the Neumann series. We have a scene and for selected phases we see one selected term of the Neumann series and also one exemplary path of the considered flux. At phase i we see the source term, in this case the component i of the emission vector Be. At phase j we see an illustration of the radiosity contribution from the term f times Be. We are at phase j, so here we have the component j of the respective vector. The green path from a source phase to phase j is one example of the flux that is considered in the term f times be. At phase k, we see an illustration of the contribution from the term f times f times be. Again, one exemplary path is visualized to show that this term accounts for the radiosity contribution at this phase due to emitted light after two bounces. The last example is phase L, where we see an illustration of the radiosity contribution due to emitted light after six surface bounces. Again, you can imagine that the contributions typically get smaller and smaller for a growing number of bounces. Here on this slide we see visualizations of the radiosity contributions of the terms in the Neumann series for an example scene. The scene that we see is the Cornell box where we see the inside of a box with two cuboids and one light source on the top of the box. In the first image we see the contributions to the final radiosity values at all phases due to emitted radiosity. As only the light sources emit light, we just see the light sources. In the second image, we see the radiosity contributions due to emitted light after one surface bounce. So here we have contributions at all phases that are directly illuminated by the light source. For phases that are in shadow with respect to the light source, this term is zero corresponding to black in this image. The next two images show the radiosity contributions at all phases due to emitted light after two and after three bounces. Here we particularly see that the contributions get smaller for a growing number of bounces. It's also interesting to note that the phases of the light source also reflect light. So the light source phases are not black which means that the radiosity at the light source phases is a sum of emitted and reflected light. Now, when we add all terms of the Neumann series, then we get the final result as illustrated in this image sequence. Here it is particularly interesting to note that the result gets brighter for a growing number of considered terms. But as the terms in the Neumann series converge to zero, the sum of the terms converges to a final result. When we compute the full light transport in a scene, then some light paths are more relevant for the final result, while the contributions from other paths might be smaller and less relevant. So in radiosity, but also in all other global illumination approaches, it makes sense to have an intuition which aspects in the computations are more relevant and which computations might be simplified or even omitted. 
It's rather obvious that the emission terms at phases are highly important because they are represented in the first term. Then phases that have large form factors with respect to the light source phases are important because these phases significantly contribute to the second term in the Neumann series. Then pairs of phases with large form factors are highly relevant. If one of these phases receives flux, then a large portion of the reflected flux is received by the other phase. And also phases with large reflectance coefficients are potentially important. If such a phase receives flux, a larger portion of this flux is reflected and contributes to the illumination of other phases. Another interesting aspect that I'd like to briefly discuss is the relation of the Jacobi solver with the Neumann series. If we implement the update of the Jacobi solver with a particular set of lambda values as shown here, then the update for all phases can be written in matrix form and we get B L plus 1 is equal to BE plus F times BL. When we now initialize the solution vector with zeros, then the first solver update results in a solution vector that is equal to the source vector. In the second solver update, we get BE plus F times B1, which is equal to BE plus F times BE. Then in the third update, we get BE plus F times BE, plus F times F times BE, and so on. So in each solver iteration, we add a term of the Neumann series. This means after n solver iterations, we have considered all light passes from the light sources with up to n surface bounces. This interpretation of the solver steps is certainly nice, but it does not necessarily apply to other iterative solvers. The last aspect that I'd like to briefly mention is the solver convergence. The solver converges if the reducity contributions from the terms in the Neumann series get smaller. This is the case if at least some phases in a scene partially absorb incident flux and if none of the phases amplifies incident flux. So the reflectance rho should be smaller or equal to 1 for all phases and at least for some phases rho should be smaller than 1. For smaller reflectance coefficients, the system matrix I minus F gets closer to the identity matrix, which improves the solver convergence. That's it about the second part of the presentation of the radiosity concept. Thanks for your attention.